So we will begin tonight with a presentation from the county. We have 4th District Chief of Staff Bob Nelson with us, and he does have a PowerPoint presentation to be pulled up. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Nelson. You're welcome. Thank you. All right, Madam Mayor and Council, thank you for having me here today. As I mentioned before, Bob Nelson, Chief of Staff for County Supervisor Peter Adam. Originally, we requested public health to be here tonight, but unfortunately, with everything that they're involved in, um, they were not able to send a representative. I am a poor representative of that department, but I will do my best to, <clears throat> excuse me, present a presentation that they put together about COVID-19 from the county health uh, perspective. As well as this presentation, the county has been holding regular press conferences that are available on the County of Santa Barbara's um, YouTube channel. And today we began, uh, we reached out to the city and we were working on making sure those presentations are also available on the city's site as well. So um, starting off here, the county also has a website that we set up specifically for um, the COVID-19 crisis, publichealthsbc.org. And as of this morning, the current status was two confirmed cases in the county. Um, there's a new um, created community testing criteria that has been est established. Okay, thank you. Again, the website that we have up there and you'll be able to see some of this information is on there as well. So far, the county has completed 128 tests. Of those 128 tests, 31 of them are negative. 96 are still pending and two positive. So the criteria for testing, because you guys have all heard in the news that it's a, there's concern that a lot of people want to get tested, but there may not be the testing materials available. So the county has decided a tiered process to make that decision so that there's, as, lo, as, lo, as well as not being a run on hospital facilities, there won't be a run on tests and making sure those who are most vulnerable are tested first before um, the rest of the public. So the tier one are patients who are hospitalized or severely ill, healthcare workers, EMS providers, and other first responders, and then those uh, symptomatic individuals residing in group settings. So that might be a homeless shelter, a jail, or a long-term care facility. So those are the first people that are prioritized for testing. Second tier would be those who are 60 years or older who are exhibiting um, symptoms and those who have health conditions that might be at risk. The third tier are those who are exhibiting um, the different symptoms of COVID-19. Generally, I've talked to a lot of healthcare professionals, they will first test you for the flu, influenza, to rule that out first. If, that, if you have that, you won't have COVID-19, and then they'll send you on along your way. If you don't have that, but you still have flu-like symptoms, it's a good chance that this may be something that might be affecting you. Currently, there is a, there is a uh, document, it's called the, uh, I believe it's the testing triage tool. I made those available for council and the clerk, and I have some in the back of the room, if any of you are interested. There's various tests that, uh, questions that will be asked, um, whether the patient has a 100.4 degree uh, temperature or greater, do they have a new cough, shortness of breath, or pain taking a breath. Each of these things will create a point in a point system. And once they, that people get to a five points of the different criteria, then they are eligible to be tested in the initial wave of tests. As of today, the county has 1,700 tests. Our office did some cold calls to various primary care physicians in um, the North County, and we're hearing that um, more and more of them are being approached by Quest Diagnostic or the county to provide them tests so that they can test their patients as they come in. Um, also, some of you may have heard about uh, drive up testing. Those are usually done when there's an appointment made and some of these screening tools are done in advance and then the doctor will often choose to meet um, or a healthcare provider meet the, the patient in the parking lot, roll down their window, do the test um, briefly and then send them on their way, hopefully limiting the exposure to them, the healthcare provider or the patient to the other patients um, in the area. 
Um, here's some of the other questions that are, uh, if you had yes to those other questions, other questions include, are you 60 years or older? Have you traveled to one of the affected areas? Those include, of course, China, Iran, and Europe. Have you uh, had close contact with someone with COVID-19? Um, I think you may have heard of the two cases in Santa Barbara County, the first being uh, acquired communally, so somebody out in the public, and the second um, was a case that the person had come co in contact that we, someone we know who had COVID-19. So there is some, uh, what we call contact tracing. So to explain that, what has been explained to me is when we find somebody that is test positive, we do a, a forensic dive back into their health history, and, or sorry, who they've come in contact with um, previous to the coming into the doctor's office, family members, coworkers, have they traveled to any events? Again, that's partly how the process that you've heard about in Isla Vista, where there was five college students that went to a concert, where there was someone who had COVID-19. Um, through that contract tracing, they were identified and they've been put in quarantine. Um, so testing may not be available for three to six days. Um, so that's why you see such a large amount of um, pending tests. So all those people were in either tier one or tier two, they met some of those needs and um, have been also ruled out for influenza and then they were tested for COVID-19. That's one of the reasons why we may see this number spike in the coming days as these tests start to roll in. Once you are identified to have these symptoms, the message is to stay home, self-isolate. Um, if there, if uh, your symptoms get worse, um, you know, at that point, you may want to uh, seek further medical attention and reach out to a hospital that we've been told it's, and maybe the hospital will go into this further. They prefer to be given an advance notice before a COVID-19 patient um, shows up. Again, we're trying to limit the interaction between uh, people who have, might have other illnesses or injuries and um, those who are exposed to COVID-19. So um, again, if you are uh, symptomatic, there are certain restrictions. Um, do not have visitors at your home. Do not go to work, school, or public areas. Avoid using public transportation. Some of these common sense things that we ask people to do when they have the regular flu, we're asking them to do if they are, ha are symptomatic of COVID-19. And the other things that we all should be doing is cover your, your, uh, your coughs and sneezes, clean your hands, avoid sharing personal household items, and clean all high-touch surfaces every day. So I'm glad to answer some questions about um, from the healthcare, uh, sorry, the public health side. I also wanted to send a message to you all that the county is beginning to close public counters for our various departments. For those of you who aren't aware, the county has over 22 different departments. And um, many of our departments have a walk-up opportunity for the public. Those are starting to back away. We are not closing any departments at this point. So business should be taking place. Um, we may have less staff than normal because um, some of our employees may need to be home with their children that are uh, home from school, or if they're sick themselves, we've asked them to stay away. Um, so the county business will move a little slower, but at this point, we will still be in business. Um, there, each department that is closing their counter will have some other measure of being able to contact, whether a phone call or an email or a Dropbox, with a commitment to have a return phone call within 24 hours or one business day. So we're, we're trying to look at those things as a whole. My understanding is tomorrow we'll have a long list of those departments and the different protocols. And at the end of the day, our office, the fourth district, um, your representative on the Board of Supervisors can be a resource for the council, the city and the community to reach out to us. And we will find um, the person within the county that can help you with whatever your need is. So that's our message for you tonight. Um, again, our office will continue to be a resource for all of you. Um, please reach out if you have any questions. Thank you so very much. Does any of the council have questions for our county representative? Council Member Vega. Um, Bob, have you uh, seen the test or have you been involved in anybody that's been tested and how long would it take for a test? My understanding is this a nasal swab, so okay. it's fairly quick. That's one of the reasons why the doctors can do the, um, the drive ups. So there's a doctor I talked to today that has done it and has actually um, may have been involved in identifying some of the initial cases here in our county and uh, he's been able to meet his uh, patients um, in the parking lot to do that. Thank you. 
Seeing no other questions, Will, thank you for being um, so receptive to presenting on behalf of the Public Health Department and being so responsive as we've reached out to you for more information, and, and thank you for your support, and keep at it. All right. Thank, thank you, you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. The next entity that will contribute to this presentation is the Lompoc Valley Medical Center. Our Chief Quality Improvement Officer, Melissa DeBacker, will put, make the presentation. And I believe she does also have a PowerPoint presentation to share. Madam Mayor, members of the Council, on behalf of um, Lompoc Valley Medical Center, thank you for this opportunity to tell you about what we're doing. So what I want you to know and take away from this first slide is that uh, Lompoc Valley Medical Center is partnering in a coordinated response with Public Health, Cottage Health, Sansom Clinic, and Santa Barbara uh, Neighborhood Clinics. So all of uh, representatives, infection control uh, specialists, public health specialists have been working to collaborate on how best to manage patients who are showing up to the EDs and physicians' offices and who should be prioritized to have the testing as um, was stated earlier. So the response of Lompoc Valley Medical Center um, is multi-layered. We are continuously monitoring updates at all levels of the government, uh, which includes state, local, and federal. There's calls on a weekly basis for each of those. Uh, we're working closely with public health. Uh, we do have a planned response to an influx of patients. Uh, we call that emergency surge plan or disaster plan. And then we also uh, have a priority in protecting our healthcare workers. So in monitoring the frequently changing uh, situation, what we're doing is we're having daily briefings on the changes at all levels of government and all of the uh, changing recommendations that come out. Uh, we're uh, continually looking at supply chain and the ability to provide and obtain needed personal protective equipment for all of our entities across the organization. Patient census, we look at that on a daily basis. What patients are in site, uh, isolation? How many patients do we have? What is our staffing? Have we tested anybody for COVID-19 in the last 24 hours? And do we have any results back? Um, and again, the updated uh, regulatory guidance where um, the infection control side, we're always monitoring hand washing, masking, social distancing, visitor and public access monitoring, and educating to those things both internally and externally um, on our website. So partition, uh, participation on the weekly update calls. So um, just this week, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid uh, Services invited hospitals to participate in federal updates um, on COVID-19. We have been participating in California Department of Public Health since the end of January, early February, and then Santa Barbara uh, County Public Health and EMS, and those are ongoing. Those are both weekly scheduled and on an as-needed basis based on what uh, is uh, bubbling up in the county as far as new information. And then countywide hospital and primary care planning committee. So we are literally on, together on a daily basis, one or more times, um, managing our situation as it's fluid across not just our hospital and the patients that we serve, but all hospitals. So the steps that we've taken so far to protect our providers, patients, and visitors, and this is just a sampling. Um, we are uh, in discussion regarding elective surgeries and procedures. We know that some information came out recently from the Surgeon General, but there's some also um, other information that's been put out recently by the Hospital Association that is in consideration. Um, we are doing patient screening and triage according to the protocol that was developed by all the members of the county, Marion Medical Center, 
County Public Health, we're using the exact same triage at our ED and our um, urgent care and uh, primary cares. Visitor restrictions, um, we have implemented visitor restrictions. Um, they include but are not limited to, we just want one visitor per patient, no visitors under 16, and uh, visiting hours are gonna be ending at eight. And then starting tomorrow, we are going to be screening patients for any symptoms of illness. So uh, not even necessarily uh, COVID-19, but we don't want anybody at uh, who's compromised to be exposed to anything that's other that's floating out in the community because currently there's 20 other things literally that um, could be causing the same symptoms as COVID-19. That's one of the things that makes it kind of tricky. Uh, we are uh, in testing phase of telemedicine uh, we are uh, almost ready to roll that out so that it will be available to Medicare and Medicaid patients to uh, have access to, to health care rather than come on site. All the community education is canceled through May uh, in order to be in compliance with um, congregating and minimizing the risk of exposure. So the ability to test for COVID-19, we've seen a lot of things in uh, social media regarding this, and so I wanted to make sure I address it tonight. We are following all the testing protocols established by CDC and public health, and we are able to test, uh, we are able to perform the test at um, Lompoc Valley Medical Center. So some of the facts that I wanna make sure everybody understands is that uh, we currently have and always have had the ability to obtain the specimens for COVID-19 testing. Um, all hospitals in our region can obtain the specimens for COVID-19 testing. And um, only two public health labs in our region and Quest and LabCorp currently actually perform the test. So there's no hospitals at this time in our region that perform the test on site. You know, there's no test kit, it's a, it's a process. And so um, CDC and California Department of Public Health determine where the testing gets done. They're broadening that out so that more of it can be done, but um, that's where we're at at the moment. So the, the way that flows is um, the specimen is collected at either your primary care physician office, the hospital, or urgent care. Um, if you send it to a public health lab, um, it requires the approval of the health officer and we're issued a special number for that patient so it can be tracked. And right now, the turnaround time for those results is about one to two days. And this kind of relates back to the um, tier that um, was mentioned earlier in the first presenter, uh, the tier levels. The public health lab wants those tier one patients. Those are our sicker patients. Um, so we want to make sure we get that test turned around as quickly as possible so we can understand what we're managing or not managing, rule that out and work on other things. If uh, it's done in a private office, um, Quest or LabCorp will be doing those tests and the turnaround time on those, I guess is extended to six days now, but at the time this was done, it was four to five days on average. The Public Health Advisory for Healthcare Provider Testing was released on March 15th, and it was due to current limited testing available. And this is the reason, reason that the, um, the healthcare facilities in our region got together to develop a tier system to prioritize these patients so that we make the best use of the limited resources that we have. And the resources include testing materials, testing sites, and the number of tests that can be run at any of the testing sites in 24 hours. So there's only so many that can be run. That's being worked on and should improve in the next uh, days or weeks, but uh, that's where we're at right now. Um, so the priorities, I kind of uh, went over tier one just a little bit. Uh, where are we? Uh, hospitalized patients, severely ill regardless of age, comorbidity, first responders, symptomatic, and individuals residing in congregate living facilities like long-term care, um, jails, shelters, that, that kind of situation. 
So what can, um, what can individuals do to stay healthy? Wash your hands often, and actually it's common sense stuff that we all, we all know. Uh, wash our hands often with soap and water for 20 seconds. Use hand gel at least 60 to 70% alcohol content when hand washing is not possible. Um, avoid contact with persons who are sick. Avoid shaking hands. Cover your mouth with a tissue or your sleeve when you cough. Dispose of the tissue. Don't carry it around with you or stick it in your pocket. And then wash your hands again. So avoid touching your eyes, nose, mouth with unwashed hands and after touching surfaces because the uh, viruses are all viruses and pathogens. Most of them can live on surfaces for varying periods of time. Clean and disinfect your high touch surfaces often and then just in general practice good hygiene habits. So what do I do if I think I'm ill? Just echoing to please stay home if you are ill. Please call the physician before visiting your doctor because they'll need to prepare to receive you. They will want to um, have their staff that's going to be assessing you and maybe even performing the uh, nasopharyngeal swab to be able to have their uh, per personal protective equipment donned in, and then they will want to have a, a mask ready for you if they determine you do need to in fact come in and be seen. Um, clean and disinfect high-touch surfaces. Your, that's doorknobs, counters, tabletops, phones, keyboards, all those things that we touch in our everyday life all the time. Monitor your symptoms and seek prompt medical attention. If you're getting worse, if you start to have difficulty breathing, if it starts uh, just kind of with upper respiratory congestion and then moves down into your chest and you have tightness and difficulty breathing, those are things you want to be calling the doctor about. And if it's a medical emergency, you need to, of course, call 911. If um, you, again, I just want to emphasize that before seeking care, please call the doctor's office ahead of time and let them know that you're coming in so that we can be prepared for you. And where can you learn more about COVID-19? Um, the easiest couple of places to go uh, locally would be to our website. We keep that updated regularly. Um, co uh, we have a specific site just where patients can learn more. There's all kinds of education, up-to-date information from CDC, and there's multiple links there where um, patients can go in both English and Spanish and get information on how to take care of themselves at home and, and basic things like that. And then another really important resource is the public health. They've developed a public information portal and uh, the public can use this portal as well to get up-to-date numbers on how many patients are being tested in the community, how many positives we have, um, information for providers and for the public as well. And then if there are any questions, I would be glad to take questions. Thank you, Ms. Tabacco, for that presentation. Um, I did see it up there, but maybe for the public, um, the Comprehensive Care Center and Visitations. I did see that that has been um, eliminated, but maybe just to state for the public so they know. Right. We have the, the population that Comprehensive Care Center serves is the vulnerable, high-risk population. So at this time, there's no visitors um, on a case-by-case -case basis. Exceptions are being made. Um, and anybody, including employees, that is entering, employees, physicians, anybody going in for any reason to do their normal work is being screened as well as anybody who may be allowed in to visit a patient. But we, are, we have to protect that population of people. Thank you for that clarification. Any questions for the hospital? Councilmember Mosby. <clears throat> Being that hand washing is one of the ways to minimize this. One of the most important ways, right. hand hygiene. Don't you think it'd be prudent maybe to establish, I mean, you would be rec helping recommend that we establish hand washing stations, maybe more so throughout the town and maybe like in your case and outside of the hospital in, I mean, in our case, I can think of a few more in the city where there are hot spots where people are, are moving in and, and, and around and congregating and moving through. Uh, maybe and in front of grocery well. stores so they could get it before they touch the shopping carts and 
it seems like we could maybe wrap up a lot of this with a hand increasing a hand wash component with a foot pedaled hand washing stations throughout the town. I guess in Santa Barbara they've done a lot of this already, but. Um, that's a great idea. I'd be fully supportive of that. And also ha um, the uh, hand sanitizer gel, if you have that available, but I'd recommend putting in something that people can't take. Right, it just seems like in, you know gas stations, there would be a number of places where mm -hmm. maybe we get proactive with this and we can reduce some of this significantly. Absolutely, yes sir. Any more questions? Thank you so very much for Thank that you. presentation. Thank you. Next, we have Lompoc Unified School District's a super, Assistant Superintendent for Human Resources, Bri Valla, will present um, and take questions from Council. Thank you, Madam Mayor, City Council members. Thank you for having us here. So the Lompoc Unified School District currently has two main priorities. One, making sure that our students stay fed and then providing them educational opportunities. So we've got creative in our food delivery mechanisms. We have a variety of school sites that are offering hot food. We have staff members that are stationed in the parking lots with walkie talkies and will do car side delivery service for families. Then we also have food being delivered by school bus. So we have mobile feed, feeding stations where we have the school buses, um, in high density areas, and we have grab and go food items there, much like a sacked lunch, where families can come and get the lunches. Uh, they're for children under the age of 18, and they don't necessarily have to be Lompoc Unified School District students. If they're a Manzanita student, if they're a charter school student, we feed all kids. Everybody needs to have at least two quality meals, so we're feeding both breakfast and lunch to all students. Then we have been getting very creative in how to encourage students to continue learning during this time. Uh, we have uh, physical packets to assist students as well as resources to help parents, many who have not had to be a teacher before, especially fourth grade with fractions, that can be a little bit intimidating. So we're coming up with resources to alleviate the anxieties that may come with that, as well as perhaps some of the educational opportunities we may not think about, such as PE. So we have uh, resources for children to continue to be active even if it means they're doing so indoors. Our staff members are also getting very creative with YouTube videos and Zoom. So we have one teacher, for instance, who is going to post daily PE activities that you can do in a bathroom, a living room, um, and you don't need equipment. We're looking also at possibly having a way for families to check out PE equipment. So if they need a jump rope or a basketball, they can come to our school sites and check those out as well. It's, we're planning as we go. Obviously, we haven't experienced anything like this, but our staff are all stepping up and saying, how can I help? I wanna make sure our kids are still taken care of. We meet regularly, as everyone is well aware, this changes rapidly. So our first meeting, we decided at 8 p.m. on Sunday to close after we had the first um, confirmed case in the county. So at 5 a.m. on Monday morning, we had our first meeting with some community leaders then again, a 6 a.m. meeting with all of our school principals before they deployed out to the sites to calm all the concerns of anyone on campus and to help the families navigate what they weren't expecting. Um, we had originally stated we were gonna close on Wednesday and then um, in conjunction with school districts across the county, decided to bump that up to Monday. So we're in a regular communication with uh, Tony Thurman, as well as Santa Barbara County Office of Ed and the various districts throughout the county so that we can be consistent in how we are doing things, but also be flexible to make sure that we meet the unique needs of our community. I think that's it in a nutshell. Um, I also know that you were working to try and resolve online access for students who might not have it. You had checked with the city, and unfortunately our bandwidth is being taken up by uh, the additional cameras we were putting in place. I, I know you may be working with other entities, so mm -hmm. you'll keep us surprised as to when that might become available 
So we have partnered with Comcast. They have agreed to offer 60 days of free internet service to families. So uh, a Blackboard message went out to families today. We're using Blackboard, which um, does a phone call, a text, and an email to families. As well, um, our, uh, we have English and Spanish uh, little half sheets of paper that are going home to explain how to sign up for these services. So as a student checks out, we're having them check out um, computers if they need them for home. And so as they check out a computer, they get this form that explains um, how to utilize the services. We also have our community liaisons who are calling and helping, especially our Spanish-speaking families, where this might be a little bit intimidating. A form can have a lot of stuff on it to fill out and it can just seem like a lot so trying to help lessen the anxiety that may come with that as well um, some of our staff have been very creative because families have shared that it's difficult for them to get to a school site so we've had multiple staff who have been delivering homework packets to school sites and our out-of-town schools are also having in-town pickup locations for families that, especially for schools like Vandenberg Middle School where many of our families who attend those schools can't readily get all the way out to VMS. So we're um, kind of making it up as we go along and listening to feedback from family members and from community and from staff and modifying and adjusting to make sure that we meet everybody's needs. Does anyone on council have any additional questions for the school district? Seeing none, thank you so very much. We now have a doctor and superintendent and president, Dr. Kevin Walters from Allen Hancock, who will give us um, information on what the college campus is doing during this time. Hi, good evening. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having us here. We're, uh, um, we're proceeding with classes. We, we will take uh, an extra week of spring break. This week is spring break for us. Uh, we will take an extra week next week to do some training for faculty so that we can provide uh, alternative modalities. We have, uh, um, I think most of you have been out to the campus and it's a pretty complex operation. Um, I don't know how you teach welding online. So uh, we're not going to be able to do that. We can't, um, we can't take all of our classes online. Um, even some of our face-to-face -face lectures don't translate well into an online modality. Um, calculus and um, differential equations and physics and you know, these are these are difficult classes and the students need those if they're going to get into uh, CSU school or Cal Poly or UC system so we've uh, we've been following very closely the uh, the guidance from the CDC and from the Santa Barbara County Department of Health that who have not yet said that we should be closing schools and so we've been sticking with that um, I'm a little other oh, just we're all carrying around our little bottles of Hancock sanitizer, and mine's getting low, so maybe I'll steal some of yours. But uh, um, so um, what what we'll be seeing on campus is uh, students students get an extra week of spring break. We're going to add that on at the end. Uh, we've been working with our local high school districts because we have concurrent enrollment classes. Um, the Lompoc schools have been good. We we, we have uh, those teachers need to continue that instruction. Um, we have accrediting issues that are different from the high schools. Uh, you know, all the high school stuff is, is based on state rules and our, is based on our region. So um, we're doing all we can to keep social distancing. We had an ad administrative team meeting today um, by Skype. Uh, there were 36 people on the call, and 33 of them are actually on campus sitting in their office, um, including uh, one of the staff members in my office. I had to close the door because I could hear myself on her computer. So um, we're... we're, we're employing as much as we can, but um, we're very concerned about the idea that people, you know, and, and colleges are perpetuating this myth that you can flip a switch and move all of your classes online. And I can assure you that the, the information our faculty are teaching is way more complex than being able over the course of three or four days to just flip that into um, some kind of an online format. Um, the final thing I'll tell you is we're trying to keep all of our classes as synchronous as possible. So even if a faculty member moves a class to an online modality, we're gonna ask them to teach that class during the normal class time. Students signed up for face-to-face -face classes and we wanna honor that decision. Um, we want the faculty member to be there and, and there's any number of ways they could do it. They could do a live stream video conference. They could, uh, we have resources where they could videotape themselves doing a lecture and they could do a chat. 
Um, they can do an old school conference call if they want to. That's, um, but we want that to be in real time so the students have access to the faculty members. Um, we're calling it alternative modalities. We can't get the media to do that, but we're calling it alternative modalities because we know in some of our classes, for example, our automotive classes or our welding classes, maybe what we have to do is, you know, the classes meet twice a week, have the students meet in person once a week and split it into two. So there's an A group and a B group. So there are fewer students in that class and then come up with some sort of an assignment that they do in between, um, in between that meeting day. So um, our faculty are very talented and very creative. Um, we start on Monday. Um, we actually started two weeks ago planning for this. We asked our faculty to start thinking about how you can do it. And, and our faculty have been very responsive to that. Uh, we did declare, uh, uh, make an emergency declaration yesterday. Um, that gives us a little more flexibility under, uh, under state rules and, and, and uh, accreditation rules. So, um, but until further notice, classes are continuing as, as, uh, uh, as planned. Oh, I would say, I forgot, the, um, we're, we're really concerned about the online distance education. We will be keeping our campuses open, which could also be good for the Lompoc students. Um, um, if they're for the current concurrent enrollment students anyway they have H numbers and they can come on campus they can stay outside they can we're going to keep computer labs open and some large areas open where the students can come in and actually use uh, use our Wi-Fi we're going to keep that available for them uh, we know that you know even though the students have phones most of our students have phones they don't have the unlimited data plan so they need to be able to come somewhere we even have Wi-Fi into some of our parking lots so they can actually sit in their car and do the Wi-Fi from there um, we're kind of excited about the Comcast thing too, but um, you know, if you don't already have cable at your house, you know, I, you know, we, we, we used to complain about the four hour window that Comcast would give us. I can't imagine what the window is today. So, um, um, you know, getting that put in and getting that put in quickly um, for our students is probably not the best option. So we're looking for some other, some other ways we can do that. Any questions for Hancock? Thank you so very much for sharing that. I know that's been a huge impact for a lot of us, and you're right, it's very difficult given the types of classes taught at Hancock to, to move to online, so thank you for being here. Thanks. Now we'll have a presentation from our city manager along with our police chief and fire chief. Thank you, Mayor and Council. This is, uh, as you probably all realize, when we start working on this, everything for this meeting, we, we're prior-wise, we're already having our other meeting on March 3rd. We're already working on things for this meeting. Um, we had been prepping for this presentation, and I tell you, we just couldn't keep up. It was truly minute by minute. Some meetings we had, we'd get a message during the meeting that something changed. So um, as we go along, these things have just constantly been catching us off guard. I appreciate everybody that came and spoke tonight because that was one of our big things. We wanted to make sure that we weren't just siloed by ourselves. We wanted to make sure we knew what the school district's doing, the college doing, the hospital's doing, and the county is doing. And uh, it, I believe it's worked out quite well for us in that manner. As we go forward through this quick presentation, this is going to be on our website. We've actually created a, um, I hate to give it that notori notoriety, but a COVID-19 webpage for itself on our website. Um, as we get any updates, they will be pushed out to that website so people can go there. Um, as mentioned earlier by Mr. Nelson and uh, the hospital district, the best place really to get the best up to date is probably the county health because we get all of our information from them. But um, just wanted to give you that, that update. That's really small. Um, so this is just a quick overview. We all know what the virus is probably at this point. It's something we don't want to get. We want to do everything we can to keep ourselves um, from getting that. As been mentioned uh, the last couple speakers, you know, we want to wash our hands, keep the social distancing and everything else. Um, the World Health Organization did declare it a pandemic, which is different from the epidemic, which pandemic pan meaning worldwide. So it's, it's everywhere now. President declared the national emergency just a few days ago, Governor Newsom declared a state of emergency for the conditions caused by the virus, um, social distancing, small gatherings. 
Um, the president now, we, this is where I was talking about keeps changing. We went from 1,000 in a group to 250. In one meeting, we heard the president said, you know, 10 or more is, or 10 or less is the best way. Um, there's now, just before we came here, I changed it from one confirmed case in Santa Barbara to two because we just got that information. We have five students in quarantine down in the um, Isla Vista, UC Santa Barbara area, and you've seen the other part about the outstanding tests. And we put on there today at 113, there was 5,800 cases because it's changing daily. So there's just a lot going on with this, this virus that's out there. Um, Santa Barbara Health, the, the county health department, is the best way to go. Um, they have a, a new website, it was mentioned. We're on weekly with them. Um, every phone call they have, they have a conference call, we are on it. I was on it with the mayor. On Sunday, we got a call. We were on it for an hour and a half. They were giving us updates. Um, so we will get updates every week from them. If it needs to be something sooner, they'll let us know and we'll go in. Um, but they do have a call center. We talked about, do we want a, a city call center? But the best way really is to have one central point. So uh, the county has a call center. You can see it down there at the bottom down here, the 833 number. Um, so any general questions are there from eight to five every day. Resources for employers, workers, and businesses. This was something that's brand new. Just added this to the slide this morning as we were working on this. So the um, new place you can go, it's, it's up here at the top, the labor, California Gov, coronavirus. I would go to there if you're having issues individually with your, your own business, your work. Um, if you're an employee, it's going to have a lot of the different information up there from insurance to paid leave. Um, the Small Business Association or agency is um, also working on potential loans for businesses to try and make it through this period of time. You've seen San Francisco is almost on a complete lockdown. Los Angeles is, you know, bars, restaurants are on a complete lockdown. So if you were in that same situation, it's best to go to the SBA and look at their website. The bottom one was FEMA. That one is, it's in flux right now. The best thing is that the president did declare a national emergency. So it does open up FEMA dollars for more things than just fire floods, those types of situations. So we're looking at that, seeing what we can do. We're working with the county. We're sending in weekly packages to the county on any expenses that we have. I've asked um, staff as we've gone through, and I'll get to that in a minute, the different meetings to start collecting any data we have. So even if someone calls in about an issue that maybe with their business or an individual, we're gonna take everything we have and make sure the county is made aware of it as, as the FEMA part comes more available. We talked about this one, how do you avoid it? Wash your hands is the number one best way. You know, limit your contact, cover your mouth, so I won't go through all those, but we've gone through this. People see it everywhere, um, trying to do your best to stay very clean. Uh, this is the important one for me. What has the city been doing? We've had questions, emails. What are we doing? Well, we've tried to do everything we can and meet the guidelines of the president, the state, the county. Uh, we're re remaining in contact um, with the other stakeholders, as I said. We're trying to figure out what is everyone doing. We don't want to overstep someone, duplicate something else. So we're trying to keep in touch with everybody. Uh, almost constant contact with the public health department. I've been getting messages throughout every day now on, on what's going on. The other one we've met here, I'm not gonna go through the whole list, we can see that, but I've been meeting with our staff. When this started to come about, I had uh, sort of a all heads meeting with the department heads. First question I sent out on an email, not knowing it was gonna get to this point, is who's mission critical? What is mission critical? Well, we know public safety, police and fire is mission critical, but when you think about it, so is water, so is sewer, so is sanitation. You don't wanna have your pile, your trash piling up. So in a city standpoint, most of the city is mission critical. So then we went from what is mission critical to who do you have to have that's mission critical? You know, who can work from home? Who has to be sent home that might have underlying conditions and whatnot? So we've been having multiple meetings uh, daily. I've been calling them with like an hour's notice saying everyone come in, we gotta meet and go over the next piece of it. Other parts we have done, we followed the direction is closing uh, the aquatic center, and that's through April 5th. We're gonna be doing sort of a bi-weekly update, see how that's going. Um, the, the Dewey Center, that's the same thing. We've closed that down. 
Um, uh, different events have been you know, either canceled or postponed. Easter egg hunt, there's about 1,000 people attend that. That's far above what we're supposed to do as a group. So unfortunately, that one's had to be canceled. Um, we did do a closure of the library just the day that we were talking about it. They had about 200 to 250 people in the library. It was uh, a lot of people. The school had been out that day, planned outage, but uh, it was very, very full. So we had to go ahead and close that for now. We're going to be revisiting that. Working with the librarian to see if there's a way to do curbside pickup. People can call in, we'll bring the book out to you and you can drive off, so trying to you know, keep that going. One that came up in multiple questions is down here, utilities and the safety of it. One was water. Are we going to have water and is it going to be safe? Is it going to get contaminated? No, it's not going to get contaminated. It's tested daily, as usual, it's tested daily. From a functioning standpoint, we have more than enough uh, people there to work on it. It is like our wastewater plant. Uh, there's a lot of, not a lot of people, there's a number of people there daily, but most of the time it's doing maintenance on it. So it will continue. We actually have three or four days worth of water stored in tanks too. If something critical happened, if it did, then we would you know, implement immediate uh, sort of drought restrictions as we've done before. But, there's contingency plans in place for water, for sewer, for all the different utilities. So we don't see any issues with that one. Um, redundancy, we have staffing in place. Our directors looked on for consultants or contractors that could come out, say one whole utility got infected, then we have ability to go out and get outside contractors to come in. But all utilities are up, they're all functioning. We don't see any, any issues with that uh, coming forth. I uh, have two guests up here, so we're going to go first with the police. I'm going to ask Chief Mariani to come up and go over because the police have taken a different approach and so has fire, and I thought it's best to come from them what, what's going to happen. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. We should probably uh, entitle this presentation In Search of the New Normal because of the challenges that we're facing. But in looking at uh, the concerns that the COVID-19 pandemic has posed, I checked with some of our neighboring jurisdictions. I've been in communication with other agencies to see what they were doing. And so the first thing that we um, started to do last week was we uh, restricted jail visits with the exception of attorneys. Uh, we have no station tours anymore. We don't have ride-alongs, uh, no unauthorized visits, uh, volunteer hours have been suspended, we are not conducting live scans, court-ordered registrations will be provided by appointment only on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m., and the front lobby has been closed until further notice. We also uh, relocated the juvenile confinement area from the watch commander's office to the dispatch supervisor's office. All police vehicles are being sanitized at least twice a day, and super supervisors have been charged with monitoring and ensuring that we have sufficient cleaning supplies and safety equipment is available. Uh, one of the things that we were short on was masks, and the fire department was able to procure some, which we made available first and foremost for our uh, patrol officers. Lastly, um, as has been repeated several times, all personnel are encouraged to practice good hygiene habits to minimize exposure and contamination. The big challenge for us uh, last week when I was asked to assess mission critical positions of the 62 positions that I have, I believe 60 are mission critical. In other words, jailers can't work from home, dispatchers can't work from home, police officers can't work from home. So our folks have to be here to address the calls for services that will continue to be made for uh, public safety. And I'm pretty sure that's the same for fire. Uh, so those are our big challenges and uh, we'll continue to manage and, ad and adjust. I can say that um, our personnel have been pretty positive through this. And what I constantly remind people is that we are oftentimes are the most visible and accessible arm of government. So we have to do our very best to continue to provide a sense of calm and to be responsive to the needs of people. And that's what we'll continue to do. We'll go with 
fire next. Good evening, Mayor, Council, Jerry Kurz. Well, first off and foremost, I want you to know that the fire department is here for the city, for the community. We will be here, we'll be here through this whole thing. We, um, we've been handling medical emergencies for a very, very long time. Part of, some of the things that we are doing is we've increased our, our PPE, our personal protection equipment. One of the th we've always worn masks, we are, wear eye protection, we wear gloves, now we're adding some gowns. Other than that, it's gonna be pretty much business as usual. We're gonna be responding to calls, we're maintaining our social distance, and at our station, you know, we uh, have canceled all public education, we have no tours, uh, our station lobby is closed, we have no ride-alongs, so we're trying to limit all that, you know, doing our social distancing. Um, we're in constant uh, communications with uh, public health, uh, com uh, county OME, county chiefs. I'm on conference calls every single day. The county chiefs has one specifically for county chiefs, so we know what every department in the county fire department is doing, and we compare notes and ideas and even share equipment if, if need be. Um, the other, the other things, you know, that, um, you know, we're using our best practices, we're uh, following all CDC requirements and uh, ways to handle this. I know a lot of people out there have been just inundated with so much information, they don't know where to go. But up there you can see uh, there's two websites that are great. Uh, they've been mentioned probably two or three times already tonight. And if you go to that, uh, you should be able to find just about every information you can. One of the things we want to remind everybody is that um, we can't overload the 911 system. So, you know, care for each other, you know, contact your physician if you have trouble, it was mentioned earlier, and um, just try to prevent the 911 from overloading the 911 system. If you guys have any questions, I'm willing to answer unless you would like to wait. Any questions for either of the chiefs regarding the uh, concern about response times or any of these new implementations? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you for being the face of our community during this crisis. I appreciate you both and all your team. A couple more slides here. Uh, we just, we're gonna have again, this is all gonna be out on our website. Um, we created a, a page or a, a full web page for it. Um, different places to go, again, probably third, fourth time, CDC, World Health, or County Public Health, City of Lompoc. These are different ones that we thought were available or, or fundamental for everybody to go to. Uh, again, if you have any concerns, you wanna just talk to somebody about what should you do and you're not quite understanding it, the county does have their hotline available for everybody to call in. So the next steps, what do we do? How do what, what should we be doing? One, tonight you'll see we have an emergency declaration approval. What this does is it allows us now that FEMA's, uh, with the as I said, the national emergency has been declared by declaring this as, as pretty much every other city has done, counties have done, states have done. It does open it up for us to turn in um, the, ability, the, the different costs that we might incur during this uh, issue that we're in. We're also going to be verifying again, I didn't have time so I put it in here just this afternoon, verify the mandate from the governor regarding such things as utilities not being shut off, uh, potential rent increases, um, evictions, and there's a whole litany of things that, that came about. So we're going to be going through and, and verifying that and see what we can do as a city to, to help out. 
Um, the idea tonight is to possibly model after the PG&E power shutoff, volunteer, which they voluntarily implemented, a moratorium on service shutoffs, um, you know, uh, late pay, late fees, and, and whatnot. So that's up for discussion. The potential city hall lobby closure, my first instinct was go ahead and do that. But since we're having a meeting tonight, I put it up here on the list. And what it is is really closing the doors, listing out where everybody can go to make their payments for utilities. Um, the planning department, building department, and any others will have up there listed by phone number. They can make appointments with any of the departments and come in into an area where we can have the social distancing and whatnot go on. Um, for those trying to make a utility payment, we do have online payments. We have mail-in payments, uh, someone who does, and we do have a number of people that pay in cash. We just ask either, we don't like to take cash because that can always be a problem, but really to go get a, a money order, throw that in the yellow box out front, and we'll collect it that way too. So there's, there are different options available for them to do that. Um, but I did query every single city and the county, and uh, they're all closed in their lobbies. County's a little different. They don't have a lobby like we do with the way it's set up or other cities, but they're closing down even their planning lobbies. Um, another discussion we need to have, though, is future council meetings. Do we do this? Do we do a teleconference? You know, what, what do we want to do on that? How do we want to proceed? Um, strictly with mission critical items. We don't, you know, the idea is not to have anyone else infected in, in, in the city of Lompoc or anywhere else. Um, last one is a subset of that is committees, commissions, and boards. Do we want to, until further notice, just put those on hold until this subsides, or do we want to continue having those? My one caveat would be if you do go that direction, the planning to, uh, commission would to still have those and do what you're doing now is try and have as much social distancing as possible. Uh, one last one, this just came about. This is happening in San Francisco, as I said earlier, LA and different places, Santa Barbara County. The public health is recommending bars, nightclubs, pubs, breweries, wineries, you know, places that people can congregate to close to the public under the new guidance. Uh, it hasn't been a edict that says this shall be done, but it's up there for discussion. Um, additionally, the restaurants and other food facilities that have done this can still offer takeaway service. You can drive up, they'll bring it out, or walk up to the door and they'll hand it through the door for you. And again, we've seen this before, but the summary for prevention. So with that, I'm open to questions, comments, the discussions that need to be had. Mayor. So I do believe, according to our city attorney, the next steps we need to hold off that discussion until we've added it potentially as an emergency items to the agenda and we will make that um, a next step after consent calendar. So any other questions aside from the next steps areas are appropriate at this time. Council Member Mosby. Yeah, a couple questions for you that have been asked over the last month or so about some of our facilities it might help ease the people's tensions a little bit but um, what's going on with the HVAC system at the PD? So that was uh, an approved item it's been out of service for a couple of two three years now so they're almost done I think the chief was around here do you want to speak on that one I know the right now if we had to open an EOC it's going to be in here because currently the equipment all the replacement parts are in our formal EOC so the, the contractor started work last week and they're making a lot of progress. I'm being told that they probably will complete ahead of schedule. So we're pretty excited about that. But uh, they've had a full crew here every day uh, during the week. And uh, so hopefully we're pretty optimistic that that's gonna be within the next week and a half or so will be done. Okay, it, one other question for, no, the city manager, not you. Oh. Congratulations, almost like Christmas in uh, March, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there, there was also a statement made uh, about Station 1 being an unreinforced masonry building. Is there any updates on any of that? No, that, that one, we actually had a structural engineer, is the term, um, come out not too long ago to, to look at some of the issues that were out there. And no, it's, it is a reinforced structure. The only part that may not be is the original jail, I mean the really old jail in the very back, that they just store extra gear in there. That'll help a few people relax a little bit. We have. Facilities aren't going to fall down around ourselves and yep. 
there'll be heat soon in the uh, police department for you guys. Any more questions other than the next steps before we move on from this item? I just want to thank all of the participants for sharing the information and providing a centralized presentation for our community. We're all getting quite a few questions, and we all wanted to share that we're on the same page. We're all in communication with each other. All of these PowerPoints that were presented will be on the city website tonight um, after the meeting. And then again, the video will be available online through our YouTube channel, and the link will be on our city site. Um, for those of you that are experiencing stress regarding um, food, the food bank, um, which is a link that will be provided, is doing additional um, pickup areas, smaller, less um, crowds, and will do it more often so that we don't experience um, strife in our community with food resources. Again, the school district has a list of where they're doing those. And our Dewey Center, while we canceled all the senior programs, the senior nutrition program is still active so those seniors can get their meals because one of the things we didn't want to impact our community was access to food. Um, Thank you again, all of you. Again, during the meeting, I don't normally have my phone out, but I have because we're getting ongoing messages and notifications, and one of the most recent ones that I will share with you, just as an example of constantly changing and moving, the governor has now placed the National Guard on alert to perform humanitarian missions regarding um, food distribution, ensuring resiliency of supply lines, and supporting public safety as necessary during this. So again, this is constantly shifting, constantly changing, and we're just trying to coalesce a centralized source of information for our community and provide the most trusted resources we can for it. As I've been saying to each and every one of you, be safe, keep calm, and carry on. This is a kind of community that comes out and supports each other, and we'll get through this. So thank you for respecting um, all of the seriousness of this, the sooner we can, as they say, flatten the curve and prevent a massive infection, the easier it will be to deal with the onset of the infections that will incur. <laughs>